This is lecture number five in a series of 22 lectures on the chaotic kingdom stage, the seventh stage in the Old Testament. And we just finished a study of the life of Elijah and uh, had begun an introduction to the life of Elisha, who was Elijah's successor. Even though these two men, Elijah and Elisha, wrote no written scripture for us like the other writing prophets did, yet these two men are doubtless some of the greatest prophets of God that ever lived. We've already looked at Elisha's call and also his determination at Gilgal and at Bethel and at Jericho when Elijah puts him to the test and says, now look, I'm going to be caught up soon. Why don't you just forget about this and go home? But he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Jerry Falwell has said this, I suppose, a hundred times in my hearing, and the statement is this, that God never uses a discouraged Christian. And I believe that, and I think also the statement that he often makes, and that's probably the success of his ministry, and he says this, that God does not determine the greatness of a man by his eloquence or his education but by what it takes to discourage him. And what a fantastic statement that is and how true it is. And uh, Elisha was not discouraged. So his determination to follow God. And then, of course, his request at the beginning of the ministry, even before Elijah was taken up, he asked the, the question, Elisha, what would you like and uh, what final thing can I do before I leave? He said, I want to double portion. Elisha said, I pray thee, quoting from 2 Kings 2 verse 9, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And uh, God gave him that double portion. How do you know God did? Well, there, uh, when Elijah was on this earth before he left, Elijah performed seven recorded miracles. Now, he probably did more than that, but there are seven miraculous things that Elijah did. And then Elijah is removed from the scene. And Elisha now works miracles. And how many would you suppose, how many recorded miracles do we have uh, where Elisha is said to have done them? And that's right, exactly 14, twice the number of Elijah. And so God did indeed answer his prayer and give him a double portion of the power of the Spirit of God. Some of these miracles are uh, very interesting. Of course, they all are, but some more than others. And uh, one of the first miracles after he parts the Jordan River is at Jericho, Elisha purifies a polluted city well with a bowl of salt. And uh, we're going to see throughout his ministry that he does a lot of these miraculous things uh, by using small, insignificant things. For example, here he does a miracle with a bowl of salt, and uh, later on he'll uh, do a miracle with, uh, well, some other things. Uh, on one occasion he'll, he'll throw a, a little plant into a, a bowl of uh, some poisonous stew, and I'll comment on that pretty soon. But when I <clears throat> thought of God using the little things in Elisha's life, I thought of this poem. It's called Infinite Power, and sort of speaks about this. It says, In the hand of Moses, naught but a shepherd's rod, yet it parted Red Sea's waters in the potent hand of God. In the hand of stripling David, only slingshot and smooth round stone, but in the name of the Lord of hosts, Goliath was overthrown. In the hand of a lad so little, merely two small fishes and bread, but he laid them in the hands of God, and the multitudes were fed. Do the things in your life and your hands seem futile, only the pebble or the fish or the rod? Behold, there is mighty working power in the hands of the living God. And I think it's a great statement that God spoke to Moses way back there in the first few chapters of the book of Exodus. And uh, God told him to leave the Sinai Peninsula 
and go back to Egypt and there spearhead the rescue of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. And of course Moses is very concerned about what power he'll use and what authority he has to do this. And God asks him a question. He said, what is that in thine hand? And he started with what he had. He, had to ha he happened to have a shepherd's rod in his hand. It could have been a rock. It could have been a, a gun. It could have been anything. But it was, a, it was a rod. And God started with what he had. God uses men the way they are. And here he uses Elijah. So at Jericho, he purifies a polluted city well. And then at Bethel, a little later on, he has the opportunity to set some young Hulam straight. In fact, he's surrounded at Bethel by a gang of uh, really young punks. Now, the King James says that these were little children. And, of course, in your notes we have this pointed out that uh, these uh, so-called children here in chapter 2 are not children at all. These are young men in their late teens or maybe even early 20s. But later on, it speaks of David... Uh, even after he was a warrior and everything, the same Hebrew word is used here, Y-E-L-E-D, speaking of the, um, of the man David. And so uh, they, these are certainly not little children that are making fun of his bald head. They're ridiculing not so much Elisha here at Bethel, but they're ridiculing God. Because notice their statement, uh, go up thou bald head, go up. It's not simply kidding a person about not having too much hair on his head, but it's ridiculing the God that this prophet represented, and it's actually it's an attempt to ridicule the rapture of Elijah. A lot of people make fun of the things of God today, and they were doing that uh, in those days. And notice that uh, Elisha causes now two female bears to appear and uh, 42 of these arrogant rebels are clawed as a, as a divine punishment. It does not say any of them are killed, but uh, maybe after that clawing and mauling and everything, we would like to think that that might have put the fear of God in some of them. But notice, 42, here's a whole gang, a young army of these rebels, and they're ridiculing the God of Elisha, not his bald head, but his God. And God steps in and punishes them for that. So this is what happens at Bethel, but it was a miracle. And then at Samaria, he rescues a poverty-stricken widow of a Bible Institute student. That is to say, this Institute student had died and left this widow. And uh, she was threatened uh, by her creditor to throw her out in a snowstorm, as it were. And so Elisha orders the woman to borrow every possible container that she can come up with from her neighbors and then pour her remaining jar of olive oil, and that's all she had, into these vessels. Well, she did this by faith, and every container was supernaturally filled. And of course, then she has a chance to sell that later on and solve her indebted problems, indebtedness and everything. And as we said, God loves to use the little things in this life. Uh, at a place called uh, Shunem, as he goes on, Elisha raises the dead son of a prominent woman who had befriended him. And thus, here we have in this chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Kings, the second of eight biblical resurrections in the Word of God. Elijah did the first. Elisha will be the instrument whereby the next two are raised from the dead, and then uh, that's all you read about until you get to the New Testament. At Gilgal, and you remember Gilgal was close to the Jordan River, and this is where Israel made their first camp in the book of Joshua when they crossed the Jordan River, the first stop on the western bank of the land of Palestine. At Gilgal, he purifies some poisonous stew. Apparently, uh, one of the Bible students was a better theologian than he was a cook, and uh, so he had unknowingly put some poisonous wild gourds in. Maybe they were making mushroom soup, and it turned out to be toadstool soup. 
So upon discovering this, he um, purifies the soup, that is to say Elisha does, by throwing some meal in it. Again, God uses these little things. And uh, then at a place called Baal uh, Shalisha, uh, Elisha feeds a hundred men by supernaturally increasing 20 loaves of bread and a sack of corn. And of course, years later, Elisha's Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will do a similar feat, except this time he'll uh, feed some 5,000 men in addition to their wives and children. And then at the River Jordan, Elisha causes an axe head to float. Before I go any further with these uh, commenting on his miracles, uh, in his book, uh, Solomon to the Exile, Dr. John Davis, or I believe now I'm wrong, I don't see the author, I think it's John, Dr. John Whitcomb, rather, from Grace Seminary, has uh, these very pertinent words concerning the miracles of Elisha. I'd like to read briefly from his very wonderful book, Solomon to the Exile. Uh, Dr. Whitcomb says, The third and fourth minor miracles in Elisha's ministry involved food supplies for hungry seminary students at Upper Gilgal. Uh, one student, possibly meditating upon Elisha's fascinating theological lectures, carelessly gathered some poisonous wild cucumbers to add to the luncheon stew. God graciously overruled this potential tragedy for good and demonstrated once again that he will add all these things unto us if we seek his kingdom first. Soon after, uh, Dr. Whitcomb goes on to say, a believer from a nearby town brought the first recorded seminary offering, an inadequate supply in the form of barley, loaves, and grain. And uh, so God, of course, takes this and, as we've already said, feeds 100 men. And then Whitcomb says, last and perhaps most fascinating of all was the miracle of the floating axe head in 2 Kings 6. Could anything have been less important in the history of Israel than the loss of an iron axe head in the Jordan by a careless student? See, these students are out chopping wood now, and probably, again, they're better theologians than they are uh, carpenters and uh, woodsmen, and uh, one of the students, his axe head flies off the axe and sinks in the Jordan River. And uh, who cares? Well, God cares about this. It's recorded. Could anything be less important? Well, Whitcomb goes on to say, perhaps not in man's estimation, but the event must be seen in proper context to be appreciated. The theological students at Jericho suffered in their studies from inadequate housing needs. The great prophet of God was asked to join with them in their little venture of faith the construction of a dormitory. Well, inexperienced and poorly equipped, their tools were borrowed. They nevertheless worked with zeal and for the glory of God. Is this God, this great God of the universe, interested in such projects? We might laugh at their feeble effort, but God's question is this, who hath despised the day of small things? According to Zechariah 4, verse 10, and quote there. When the horrified student saw the borrowed tool sink deep into the river, both he and his companions gained a never-to-be-forgotten insight into God's loving concern for his own when he put forth his hand and made the iron to swim. Later, the Lord Jesus taught a frustrated disciple a similar lesson when he commanded a fish to pick up a coin from the depths of the sea and bring it to the shore, Matthew 20, uh, 17. God, not man, determines which events are the most important. So thus writes Dr. John Whitcomb. All right, now, at Dotham, and this is north in Palestine, actually in Galilee, and uh, years later, or years before this, rather, something important also took place at Dotham. It was there that Joseph found his brothers in the book of Genesis, and there they uh, threw him in this pit and finally sold him into slavery at Dotham. 
And something now, during Elijah's time, very important, happens at Dothan also, because he is surrounded by some Syrian troops that were sent out to arrest him and his servant, a man whose name was Gehazi, G-E-H-A-Z-I. And uh, they thought, the Syrians thought, that uh, Elisha sort of had an in with God, which he, of course, did, and that uh, Elisha was uh, the cause of them losing some battles. So they said, well, we'll just arrest him. And so one morning the entire landscape was filled with Syrian troops, and Gehazi was terrified. And uh, we read this in Second Kings 6. And when the servant of the man of God, whose name was Gehazi, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. These are the Syrians now, an entire army, that have been uh, set, dispatched to arrest Elisha. Apparently the king of Syria realized the mighty power of Elisha, and so he's not sending just a few, but he's sending an entire army here. Well, his servant is just terrified, petrified with fear. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Well, Elisha doesn't, uh, he's not concerned at all. And he answered, Fear not, for they who are with us are more than they who are with them. Well, that didn't help uh, Gehazi at all. What do you mean? Uh, just you and me against the entire army. And so Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And uh, this is a very, very interesting passage. Not only does it uh, answer the question, is there intelligent life in this universe apart from man? Now, sometimes you wonder about the intelligence of man. Well, certainly that question is answered affirmably. Yes, there is intelligent life. There are cherubims and there are seraphims, two kinds of special angels mentioned for the first time, at least the cherubims in Genesis chapter 3, and then mentioned other times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And then the seraphims are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, so it answers the question, is there intelligent life apart from man? But it also answers the question, what, if any, relationship do these intelligent beings that are non-human have uh, as far as human beings are concerned. And, of course, Hebrews 1 amplifies that statement here, that they are the ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. And so here now, uh, God allows his backslidden servant, Gehazi, to see that these angels are on the job and they're ministering to the things of the Lord, uh, concerning the things of the Lord. Later on, Next semester, when we get into the book of Ezekiel, we're going to see a more in detail a description of some of these angels and ask ourselves the question, and try to answer it, what about the flying saucer reports? Uh, are they spoken of in the Bible at all? And I think passages like Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation, let's see, chapter 4, and Second Kings chapter 6, the verses we've just read from, might shed some light on some of these so-called flying saucer reports. All right, so that happens at Dotham. And uh, by the way, after Gehazi is allowed to see these angels, then the Bible says that Elisha smites these men with blindness. Uh, the Bible tells us in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 6, And when they came down uh, to him, these uh, soldiers, to arrest him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. He smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now, I assume, inasmuch as the angels of the Lord were already there, that God used the angels to smite the soldiers with blindness. Well, Elisha then leads these sightless Syrian soldiers into Samaria, 
and uh, then their eyes are opened. Well, the king of Samaria, or the northern king at that time, determines to slay these helpless soldiers. He said, here they're blinded and we've got them right where we want them. But Elisha says, oh no, uh, God forbid that we should do this. And I think this little account here, there's so many lessons we can learn from it, but I think this little account in chapter 6 uh, by itself totally refutes the devilish claim of liberals and unbelievers that the Old Testament is one huge bloody eye for eye and, uh, you know, hand for hand slaughter story. Here an entire Syrian army was defeated by sheer kindness. And so God uh, of the Old Testament is not, as one prominent theologian said many years ago, a dirty bully. God of the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. All right, so this takes place then uh, at, uh, at this time at Dotham. And then at the River Jordan in chapter 5, God allows Elisha to do a great miracle. He heals a leprous Syrian general named Nahum. And I'm going to turn in my Bible now, and perhaps if you can, turn in your Bible to chapter 5 of Second Kings. And Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, but because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. <clears throat> he was also a mighty man in valor. Interesting things we learn from this verse we learn that God apparently also directed the affairs of non-Israeli people. Not only did he direct the affairs of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, but here it says that he allowed the Syrians, uh, led by their five-star general, Naaman, to do mighty in battle. He was led by the Lord to do that. And Naaman had a lot of things going for him. He was captain of the host, the king of Syria. He was a great man, had a real rapport with the king of Syria. He was honorable, that is to say, morally, he was a good man. He was trustworthy. His troops liked him. And uh, God had blessed him, even as an unsaved man, because of his sincerity. And he was a mighty man in valor. He was a brave man, but he had a problem. He was a leper. And the Syrians, in verse 2 now, had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, who cares? Well, here you see here's a little story that uh, some Syrians now one night crossed the Israeli border, and uh, they went on a uh, slave-catching mission. And all they were able to come up with was a, a little Israeli girl. We don't even know her name, know nothing about her background, know nothing from the tribe that she came from, and, and whether she was even from the uh, north or the south, that is to say the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. But here's a little daughter of Abraham, and they come back pretty well empty-handed, they think. And so this little maid now finally winds up as uh, a maid in the home of Naaman and his wife. Now, these are good people, and uh, there's a rapport right away that exists between Naaman and the little girl and, and uh, Mrs. Naaman. And perhaps one day Mrs. Naaman uh, tears uh, fill her eyes, and so the little maid said, what's wrong? And she tells uh, the little girl about... Uh, the master of the house about her husband, incurably ill with, uh, with leprosy. And the little girl said, would to God, she said, my Lord, were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would cure him of his leprosy. She said, you know, uh, I've learned to love you folks, and I wish that Master Naaman could visit the prophet in Samaria in the northern kingdom. That was the capital of it, of course, because he could heal him. And uh, one of them went in, we're told, in verse 4, and told his Lord, saying, uh, Naaman, this is thus and such, said the maid who is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, so now probably Naaman goes to the king of his boss, the king of Syria. 
And this is absolutely remarkable on the testimony of this little, insignificant Israeli slave girl. The Syrian king sends Naaman to the king of Israel with $20,000 in silver, $60,000 in gold, ten suits of clothing, along with a personal royal letter requesting healing. What a testimony this little girl had. Now, I don't know what you would have done had you been captured that night, but probably what most of us would have done is just to sort of uh, turn our eyes away from God and we would say, well, that proves God doesn't love me. That's what I would have done, as I was tempted to do during that factory experience when I graduated and enrolled uh, was enrolled by the Lord in the DBI, the Drying Brook Institute. God doesn't love me. Uh, maybe there isn't even any God. He can't even protect me in my own land, and here I am in a foreign land, and and I'll just live the kind of life that I want to live. But she didn't do that, and she didn't uh, pout and doubt and lay down and stay down. That's what most of us would have done. God is going to now affect one of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament because of the testimony of a little slave girl. And I say one of the greatest miracles advisedly because do you know that Naaman is the only person, to my knowledge, the only male, that is to say, in the Old Testament ever to be healed of leprosy? Now, uh, he, uh, there was another person, Miriam, who was the sister of Moses that was healed of leprosy, but all the Israelis who were afflicted with this disease, none of them were healed. Now, in the New Testament, you have the Savior healing by the dozens, but in the Old Testament, a Syrian captain by the name of Naaman is the only person to be healed of leprosy. And this all stemmed back, this great miracle, because of the testimony of a little girl. Well, Naaman goes to the capital, and he calls on the king of Israel. And this is an ungodly king, and he can't help him. And there's a long story involved here that you can read about in chapter 5. But finally, Elisha hears about the uh, consternation in Samaria because of this visit of this foreign dignity. And in verse 8, and it was when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, in other words, he had done that in, in agony and frustration because he couldn't cure Naaman, of course, and he felt that the king of Syria was simply using this as an excuse to declare war upon him. And he's frustrated and everything. And so he, Elisha, sends a message to the king saying, verse 8, Why hast thou torn thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came, and the king was glad to get rid of him, of course, with his horses and with his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was angry. Well, you see, he had come here now from across the desert. This was a VIP, a very VIP, very important person. And uh, he'd come and he expected the royal treatment. He expected for Elisha to come out and gush all over him and, and uh, do some great miraculous supernatural sign right there. But Elisha apparently doesn't even come out of his modest little home, and he sends his servant out. And he says, oh yes, uh, my master is too busy now. He's writing his memoirs, and, and uh, or he's talking to the Lord in prayer. And, and uh, if you want to be healed, uh, your instructions are to go to the Jordan River and uh, duck yourself under seven times. And he was extremely angry and went away and said, behold, I fought. Well, you see, that's his problem. Dale Moody had a message on that. He said, that's where all of our problems begin. We think for ourselves. We come to conclusions concerning Christianity. Well, I thought 
that if I would do the best I can and give to the Red Cross and not cheat on my income tax and be kind to my family, well, I, I just thought that by doing that I'd be saved. That's our problem. God says, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts, your thoughts. Behold, I thought he will come and surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and cure the leprosy. And besides that, he said, uh, are not the rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? I mean, the Jordan River is a dirty river. And if I wanted to take a bath, I could have done that without coming here. So he turned and went away in a rage, verse 12. And sometimes that's the way it happens. Sometimes God has to get a man uh, mad before he can get him glad. And that certainly happened in Elisha's case. In verse 13, and his servants came near, and one of them spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? Oh, what a commentary that statement is on modern 20th century America. And I suppose this has happened all through church history. But I've often said if uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell were on well over 400 television stations now across America, if he could get on television some Sunday morning and say, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I received a special revelation from God, and uh, there's a brand new plan of salvation being offered, all you have to do, and we can guarantee you to be saved, is to get down on your hands and knees and push a peanut with your nose down a busy highway for a distance of one mile. And if you can do that and have proof that you've done it, we'll guarantee you you'll go to heaven. If he would make that statement, you know, I honestly believe that there would be people that would get down on hands and knees all across America and attempt to push that peanut, not because they believe so much in Jerry Falwell, but because this would seem a reasonable thing to do. That is to say, it's something that I can do, something that I can accomplish for my salvation. But when our pastor and when other godly pastors uh, get up, and I've been a pastor 18 years, and we have uh, over 400 men that are pastors signed up for the pastor or for the uh, Liberty Home Bible Institute course now. And uh, gentlemen, you know, you can identify with this statement. When we get up behind our pulpits and attempt to tell uh, unsaved people that salvation is not something they can do, salvation is something that's been done, then uh, they all they have to do is believe. Then they say it's too easy. There must be something more involved. A number of years ago, I I really don't want to preach. I should remain teaching here instead of preaching. But I, I heard uh, the account of uh, more, something that happened to Mordecai Ham, who was the man that led Billy Graham to the Lord. And uh, Mordecai Ham had just conducted a great evangelistic crusade. It was the last night of the meeting, and, and uh, it was on a Saturday night around 10 o'clock, and the big tent was being folded up, and Mordecai Ham was really climbing into his car to uh, move on down the road. And a young man, apparently, uh, obviously, uh, under great conviction, uh, came uh, rushing up and uh, called out to him, Mordecai Ham, Mordecai Ham, what can I do to be saved? And according to the story, the great evangelist did not even turn around. He just shook his head and said, Son, it's too late. It's too late. And this shocked the young man, and he thought, well, maybe he didn't hear me. He said, Mordecai Ham, he said, my soul is convicted of my sin. He said, what can I do to be saved? And Ham continued to shake his head, and he said, son, you're too late. You're too late. And the young man began to weep, and he turned away to go back to his car and drive off. He thought, I've committed the unpardonable sin, perhaps. I don't understand, but the man tells me it's too late. Just before he got into his car, Mordecai Ham, who had a booming, loud, baritone voice, called out, Wait! And he walked over to him, and he put his arm around him and said, Now, son, 
He said, I answered your question the way you ask it. You asked me what you could do to be saved. And he said, I said, you're too late. And he said, you are. You're 2,000 years too late. Son, there's nothing you can do. Jesus has done it all. All you need now is to accept what he has done. And he had a chance to kneel with him there and lead him to Christ. I thought he would do this. And the servant said, if he told you to do something difficult, wouldst not thou have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, wash and be clean? Naaman, I believe, has been with the Lord for many years. And I think probably the first person he looked up when he got to heaven was, was uh, Elisha. And I think the second person he may have wanted to check on is this obscure, unnamed servant that convinced him he ought to at least give the word of God a chance. All right, I'll do it. I have nothing to lose. I'm not sure it's going to work, but what faith I have, I'll commit that faith to doing the word of God. The Bible says in verse 14, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the sayings of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. What a great miracle. But again we said it was effected, accomplished because of the testimony of a little slave girl. All right, I think there are a couple of more miracles that we'd like to call to your attention to. In chapter 7, we're not going to examine all 14 miracles. I think we probably looked at about 6 or 7 already. At, uh, at Samaria, in chapter 7, Elisha predicts the salvation of a starving city. And that's also a great miracle. It has a little uh, irony attached to it. And the irony is this, that uh, a few years later, after uh, the events that took place in chapter 6, when he uh, blinded these servants, or these Syrians, and then he spared their lives. He would not allow the king of the north to destroy the Syrians. Apparently, this backfired as far as the king of the north was concerned. He felt that Elisha made a mistake. He should have allowed him to kill those because they went back. And then in chapter 7 here, we find the city of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, the city of Samaria surrounded by the Syrian soldiers, and maybe some of these same soldiers that he had spared their lives, and now they are surrounded the city of, of Samaria. And the king of the north is extremely angry at Elisha, and he's about to have him killed because uh, the way that he refused to kill these soldiers before uh, this problem came up. So at any rate, in chapter 6, Elisha predicts that salvation will take place within 24 hours. In spite of the uh, terrible uh, problem that they have here, he says that very soon deliverance is going to take place. Now, actually, this happened nine years later, and at any rate, the city is surrounded here now. So he says within 24 hours that food would be so plentiful to this starving city now, this was almost impossible to believe, that two gallons of flour and four gallons of barley grain would bring only a dollar in the Samaritan market. Now, this was at a time when women were eating their own children, according to this chapter, a very gruesome chapter. And this was a time uh, when a donkey's head sold for $50 and a pint of dove's dung brought $3. And here you mean to say that in 24 hours, food's going to be so plentiful that two gallons of flour and four gallons of barley would uh, be sold for only a dollar? Well, that's exactly what the man of God says. And, of course, we, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know how this is worked out. God, again, uses the insignificant things, the base things, the despised things of this world, and according to 1 Corinthians that no flesh should glory in itself. And one of the most base things in the Old Testament was leprosy. Some of the most despised things in the Old Testament were lepers. 
And here you have deliverance wrought through four lepers. In verse 3 of chapter 7 of 2 Kings, And there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here and die? They were starving too. But they had a double problem. They couldn't even enter inside the city. They had to starve outside the city. They said, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we will die there. And if we sit still here, we shall die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we're going to die anyway. And they rose up in the twilight, the evening now, to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the edge of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. They're going to give themselves up, and they can't find anybody to surrender to. For, verse 6, the Lord had made the host of the Syrians, the armies of the Syrians, hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, the Syrians did, and left their tents and their horses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. What a miracle this is. Well, the lepers came in Saul, and so they begin to go from tent to tent and eat of the food and probably stuff some of the money in their pockets and really rejoice because of this great deliverance. In fact, some of them even hid the loot to be used at a later day. But in verse 9 of Second Kings 7 is a verse that you need to underline. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and if we hold our peace, if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Oh, what a wonderful, significant summary here we have of the plan of salvation. Here you and me that are leprous with sin, we found the message of salvation, and we enjoy the song we sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, and, and thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. But we ought to stop some time and say, we do not well. God has saved us that we might give the plan of salvation to someone else. Do you know, some time ago, I heard one of the best summaries of a soul winner that I've ever heard, and here's what it is. What is a soul winner? A soul winner is simply one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. We do not well. And so these lepers now, these starving men, reported the good news to a starving city, and God used them and the prophet Elisha to work this great miracle. With this, we'll end this lecture.